Hi, good day. This is Mr. Shadrach coming at you with another Nibosh tutorial and past paper session for the Shadrach Safety Institute. This lesson is uh, more in line with the Nibosh diploma students and um, it's on the second part of the chapter, chapter 4, Monitoring and Measuring of Hazardous Substances. So, um, just start um to keep this one within the time frame any we want to get straight into it this uh, if you have your books um, the unit B students anyway this can be found just around uh, page 95 and we would possibly trail it off uh, maybe around page 103 so there's another lesson in this um, just uh, you know just to kind of make it fit within about half an hour to 40 minutes anyway we we'll need just to cut it right around there all right so um uh take it from the slides anyway so sampling methods irrespective of type most sampling require the following equipment the exception is passive sampling which does not require a pump a collection medium a holder for the collection medium and an air moving device the specific, the specific type of collection media, holder and pump used by the occupation and hygienist vary depending on the physical nature of the contaminant under investigation. Right? Um, so they have this really nicely in your book as well. Um, the main things you need for sampling. Um, you need um, the filter collection medium. Um, the collection head which is the holder for the collection medium. You need an air moving device which is a pump and possibly the tubing, right? I could probably think about four, even though this slide has just about three there anyway, right? Um, so methods are broadly categorized as follows. Particulate sampling methods, vapor sampling methods and gas sampling methods. Particulate sampling contaminants that fall into this category can be further subdivided particulate sampling methods are used to evaluate the following dust fumes mist fog smoke and fibers but not specifically gravimetric analysis right um so just to kind of summarize this one what i could tell you here is that you have um different types of sampling methods and maybe just a highlight two main ones from here um really you have a different type of method that is used to sample gases uh, vapors and smog, right, mist, etc. At the same time, you have a different type of sampling method or methods that are used for sampling dust, right? So, um, so this slide focuses on dust, uh, so gravimetric and chemical analysis. The dust collected on the sample sampling filter is determined gravimetrically by measurements of its weight, the weight change of the filter plus the cassette. For some dust, chemical analysis is additionally undertaken to identify composition, potential toxicity, for example, um, siliceous dust and uh, diesel engine exhaust emission, right? So, let's so run through this here. Uh, basically, for dust type of uh, sampling, they use what is called gravimetric analysis and basically what that is, it's weighing the filter and the cassette that the filter is in before uh, a worker puts on that device anyway and at the end of eight hours they would wait again the difference um, in the weight of the filter will give you an idea of the concentration of dust that the worker is exposed to over a period of eight hours right you also have microscopy for dust um, this could be used to count the number of fibers in an area of filter media to give an estimation of the fiber density in air of the contaminant. Um, generally, uh, you have something called a phase contrast um, light microscope um, that can be used and that is used to really um, you know, examine the number of fibers, for example, like asbestos that is in the filter right now it's that is actually easy well easier said but um uh re really what it uses it, it really uses the principle of um light uh the size or the thickness of those fibers 
and what you are able to see with some of those uh, with the um, with the phase contrast microscope especially is that you are able to get a different frequency and that frequency you can probably think of it like a maybe different intensity of light and based on the intensity of light they can know what they are looking at right um if you're looking at this slide we have here something known as the mdhs uh, 87 now mdhs is really not the same as um the msds right it's not the same mdhs refers to a range of guidances on the hse that has been published and what they are they are really the instructions or the procedures for testing different gases and dust and chemicals etc so you could think of this as um uh lab instructions right if somebody had to test let's say you didn't know what to do from scratch and you wanted to know well, what is your procedure for testing uh you know or, or counting asbestos fibers right you can get to google and you can put in mdhs but it's a series of course this one here is the one for using um, the phase contrast uh, microscopy right um, this one is a simple light microscope in which uh, you are able to count the number of fibers that is in the filtered medium right so um, to cut this one right here this is this would have been two ways of really estimating dust you have um, looking at the the filter mechanism right in which you are able to pre-weigh and then final weigh the filter the difference in weight though would have course been an average concentration of dust the person would have braided over a period of time and then you have of course um you know using i guess microscope right and you have two different types so you have the phase contrast and then of course you may have simple light microscope you also have the electron microscope as well right um so phase contrast microscopy analysis is a technique used for determination of airborne particulate aerosol like dust characterization enumeration of airborne asbestos fibers or fungal spores and airborne mold fragments an air sample for pcm analysis is collected on a filter medium which is dissolved using sorry during sample preparation so that the collected particulate can then be viewed under the microscope right um consideration of particle size why is it important well um, just two quick ones here why particle size is important as I mentioned if you are using the phase contrast light microscopy um, procedures anyway what would happen as I mentioned is that based on the size of the particle you may be able to get a different um, a different frequency then of light that is emitted and uh, that difference as I mentioned could be converted into uh, a visible intensity right um, of transmitted light and then based on that the observer right the lab technicians will know what they are looking at anyway you can find a lot more of that on page 104 um, of your textbook the other reason why I guess size is important particle size is important is because they do settle on different parts of the respiratory system right so I won't go through much of this this is really um chapter one right so large particles we tend to be tend to be deposited in the nose and throat really from about maybe about maybe 30 microns to 100 microns Th uh, thoracic dust um, smaller particles will be able to settle in the thoracic region from about maybe 10 to 30 microns and of course those smaller ones and between i guess um you know uh, maybe even in the smaller decimal points and point five to about seven microns will be termed as respirable dust right so why this is important is because uh, remember the, the the session here um, today is really sampling methods so why this is important is that is that based on the particle size you'll have to use like a different filter right a different filter even if it is, I guess all of this is dust you'll have to use a different filter right to capture um, you know that that average the average concentration of dust that the worker is actually you know breathing in um, you know over a period of eight hours right so um sampling head for particulate sampling involves a pump being connected to a sampling head by a length of tubing sampling heads are used to accommodate the filter and provide the anchor for connection to the pump like filters the type of sample head will depend on the particulate to be uh, sampled those commonly used are detailed in the table on the following 
slides right so uh, not to deal with it but to just look at it you have um, different types of sampling heads and again these would also mean that there may be different types of filters involved as well remember this is the same I'll show you a picture of it let me try maybe show the picture first um, right so these are the same sampling heads right that will be connected um, you know like within these systems anyway this is a sampling head that will be connected to a person right so yes the um the, the pump would may remain the same and the tube in the same but the sample head will change based on the particulate that they are looking at right um so let me get back that for you there so you have you have to know these anyway you have the ium um sampling head and filter right really used for inhalable dust and um these are more appropriately called um the seven whole head filter right you can find these i'm trying to find it in your book you can find these um just around page 98 right the seven whole head filter and those are used for inhale in, inhalable dust you have if i can go to the last one here you have the cyclone used to measure respirable dust right and um the cyclone and we look at the, the slide in the next one anyway you, you see why it gets that name right so it has a kind of conical shape at the bottom of it and uh, it gets the name because the air is moved there like for example like in a cyclone and they are able to separate out based on the aerodynamic diameter and then they are able to settle on the filter heavier particles are normally settled um, in a connecting part of the head known as the grit pot anyway so you have the IOM 7 whole head filter for inhalable dust the cyclone for respirable dust and again for larger particles you can have an open face with a cowl uh, really used for asbestos fibers man-made mineral fibers or diesel engine exhaust emissions right um so you have to know these uh simple as that um has come for exam before in that um they, they could recommend that you specify the type of sampling to be used of course we could all say gravimetric but if you think about the type of sampling head um that's what they will look for if it's inhalable dust uh you know the seven whole head filter um if it's respirable the cyclone if it's something larger you want to go with something with an open face with a cowl you'll see this in a bit a cowl is like a cylinder as opposed to a funnel the, the funnel is like i guess a cyclone uh, a cylinder or a cylindrical part of it is what you know gets that name the 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 cowl anyway right so this would have been some pictures on static monitoring um wouldn't spend any time on this static monitoring is not really what we compare in occupational health and safety especially with the workplace exposure limits because those limits are more um, meant for persons when you do static monitoring as what you're looking at on this slide this is good for the company to know that they may have dust or a particular particulate in the atmosphere but it doesn't really reflect you know the um, the workplace exposure limits of the person to get those figures you have to pin you know the badges or the sample heads as you're looking at here on the person's color and which would normally capture what is called a breathing zone which is about 30 centimeters in front of the person's face to about to the length of their ear right so um i mentioned this one before just have a look at it the seven whole head filter right uh, make sure you know that one that is used for inhalable dust uh, respirable dust the cyclone um, filter and of course the cyclone is this part to the bottom here this is the grid part I was talking about as I meant as and, and of course as I mentioned this is able to to, to move the air in a particular um, you know um, you know cyclic manner in which the the respirable dust is able to separate out itself right due to the aerodynamic diameter and then they are filtered onto the filter paper anyway right um the well this is still the ium sample anyway this would have been the filter this is the cassette this is the support grid typically when they weigh they would normally weigh the entire filter and the filter um cassette right both before and after um the eight hours unless if they have sensitive equipment that would normally um, weigh all together right 
All right, this is the cowl. The cowl has been added to stabilize the airflow across the filter. Um, the asbestos sampling head using it uses a 25 millimeter gridded membrane filter. So this is the the cowl, and this is very good for um, setting up. Let me show you the pity of that one. Setting up the sample head for collecting um, for collecting asbestos, right? Um, so what they say is that the cylindrical cowl has uh, um, an electrically conducting cylindrical cowl extended between 33 millimeters and 43 millimeters in front of the filter and what that does it does allow the asbestos to sort of collect there and then be directed onto the filter anyway right so this is the part this is the filter that you see in here and the cowl is going to be like a guide right to kind of get those um, asbestos particles onto the filter right um calculation of the eight hour equivalent twa exposure as I mentioned this before, I wouldn't go through this again too much as to say that the when you want to calculate the time weighted average, um, if you are using those filters, you want to get the filter weight before and after, before and after, then you want to get the difference between those two and then that will help you in the calculation or the calculation is not just that alone. What you'll have to do is take the weight gain in the filter and divide it by the volume of air that was running through the pump, right? There's a formula for that which is here weight gain in filter divided by the total volume of air sampled so there's a question here um let me just turn the pages as well you'll find these on page uh 108 of your textbook um if air was drawn through the filter for eight hours at a rate of two liters per minute and the weight increases 0.9 milligrams um they want to calculate the total weighted well the time weighted exposure then right um, or the time weighted average of exposure for the worker for the eight hours. So what you're going to do is take the weight gain in the filter, which is the 0.9 milligram. You want to divide that by the total volume of air sampled. However, do the units for that is in a meter cube. So what we're going to have to do, we will have to convert some stuff here. The two liters and the minutes that have to be converted to hours, right? Well, the liters that have to be converted to meter cube. And... Um, the minute gonna have to be converted to hours anyway so a nice way of doing all of that first is taking two multiplying it by 60 and this will give you um you know uh that there would have been um 60 minutes in an hour right so this is two by 60 and then they measure for eight hours so it's two by 60 by eight will give you 960 that do is in liters so we need to convert it into a meter cube so you divide by 1000 to give us 0.96 uh, meter cube. The final calculation is the weight gain in the filter, the 0.9 divided by the total volume of air um, that was sampled in meter cube. So we did the conversion already. So 0.9 divided by 0.96 will give you 0.94 milligram per meter cube approximately. So this is a nice calculation. Um, there's also another one here. And uh, this is if you are given, for example, multiple procedures or multiple scenarios how could you calculate the time weighted average right so you take the concentration and again this is hopefully that this one would actually be in um you know uh the milligram per meter cube so, it, so you take the concentration divided by the time sorry multiply by the time and then you add up those consecutive concentration and times right the product of those anyway and you divide it by eight right so this is a nice one um this is a nice one i want to come back to this in a bit just bear with me here i want to um kind of flip the screen a bit here i have a pass paper here um let me see if i get it for you all right this is um 2018 july 2018 um should be the last question right um so i think these papers are actually online still um i don't think anything has happened to them anyway right um so if you if you don't have it you can probably just check the nibosh website on the resources right um so this is really a nice one that we could stop and do right and remember i said i want to keep this presentation to about a half an hour right really will push it 
to be the 40 minutes right but that I don't want to do anyway right but um let's try to get this one done and I'll stop I guess right after this I'll kind of bring this one down to an end right I um really had so much more to say but then to make these videos a bit you know uh, I guess um, within your time frame we could stick to the half an hour right so they say here um, in a chemical process employees are exposed to two organic liquids table one below shows the average person on exposure levels to each of the organic liquids of one employee measured over an eight hour day um, assume exposure is zero at all other times so you have the table of figures here uh, let's see what we have again here um, table two uh, we have the eight hour time weighted average for liquid A is 125 parts per million and for liquid B is 50 parts per million so um, if you're not quite sure what you're looking at here right uh, what let's see what part A says so using the information in table one demonstrate that the eight hour time weighted average exposure of the employee to both liquid A and B uh, as shown in table 2 your answer should include detailed working to show how the exposure is calculated right um, so 8 marks there kinda a lot of marks and what you wanna do here you wanna take the concentrations multiply by the time for each one anyway and then divide it by 8 now if you don't know the significance of the tables we'll come to that in a bit but the tables are quite important because um, it says what the employee was doing measuring out the liquid right for half an hour the person would have been exposed here you know um, 280 parts per million adding liquid to the mixing vessel 110 parts per million supervision of mixing 150 transfer of mixtures to containers 150 now um, the second table is of course very important because not to sure if you see what they did here they actually give you the answers right the um, these are the answers that you have to get back then right this is the answer they said demonstrate that the eight hour time weighted average exposure of the employee to both liquid A and B as shown in table 2 so when you get the answer for A you're supposed to get back 125 when you get the answer for B you're supposed to get back um 50 right so uh i do have the calculation here um let me see if i can just bring that one up now right seems to be taking its own time there all right so uh, i guess um you could right so you could just have a look at it so um i guess you'll have to probably just just um just skip back on the video a bit yeah, I, I'm not going to go back and forth anyway right but the first one we saw the time was half an hour so that's 0.5 by 280 I've gotten 140 the next uh, time was one hour the exposure was 110 so that's um, 1 by 110 will give it back 110 2 hours at 150 so that's 2 by 150 300 3 hours by 150 gonna give you 450 total they will give you a thousand and then you divide it by eight a thousand divided by eight was 125 hence the TWA answer is proven for a let's do the other one at the same time right so for uh, for B um, same formula again C1 by T1 and plus C2 by T2 divided by a again it's half an hour uh, the, the average the average exposure for a was 140 at least for the half an hour so 0.5 by 140 is 70 then 1 hour for 80 80 there 2 by 50 100 3 by 50 150 add up you're, get, you're gonna get a uh, 400 400 divided by 8 will give you 50 hence the TW answer is proven for B right now uh, we're gonna go back this we can go back and see where do I have the pass paper right so I can get back that pass paper for you all again and um, let's see the second part of it right so I mean that was kind of easy this right uh, once you'd have known the formula right um, let's see if I have it saved right yes yeah. so um, you know not that difficult for the eight marks anyway uh, but there are some things we have to infer from off the question right um, should I get this back here for you all right so 
right uh, again if you get some time um, put some pen to paper and probably get this one done right so we would have proven it there we would have proven that the figures are what they say it's supposed to be right so part A would have been finished we, we got back the 125 part B is also finished right so the workplace exposure limits for the two liquids are as follows uh, E an 8 hour would have been 200 and um, for B uh, sorry for A it's 200 for the 8 hour and 250 for the 15 minutes for B it's 200 and uh, 300 respectively right so um, this of course is the workplace exposure limit let's what part B says part B says here outline what action actions the employer might need to take to control exposure to E which is an essential component of the chemical process now you know um, let's focus on the E then which is the line on top here anyway right so um, there's some things that you need to know for example Remember the workplace exposure limit is the average concentration a person can breathe without having any side effect, right? Now the average concentration um, for A for the 8 hours is 200. Now we got it to be uh, the actual exposure is 125. Now what this tells you, believe it or not, is that is that um the the measured amount in the workplace at the eight hours is actually below the workplace exposure limit so technically the company is not you know um close to nor are they breaching the workplace exposure limits in fact they are doing quite good now if you look at the question the question said outline what actions the employer might need to take to control exposure to A which, has, which is an essential component of the chemical process so what you're looking at here is that these controls here would be um, you know on the company then it's not as if they are mandated you know by caution you know the workplace exposure limit is a really an offshoot of the cost regulation anyway right that i mean they're not really mandated by law to do anything right they are within their limits in the first place but what i want to draw your attention to is that um a lot of folks could be you know could could have seen that and if and i guess i guess if you did notice that you you i guess you may be tempted to think that nothing more needs to be done however that part b is seven marks right so um so that so, so then there must be something more to be done and if you're wondering well well i guess what the answer comes back from the table now bear in mind like i said um you know bear in mind the table what you can do you, you could get those marks from looking at the procedure itself for example measuring out the liquid is where you have the highest level of exposure to the employee and if you look at this very carefully the 280 here or even though the average for the eight hours is 125 and 125 is below the workplace exposure limit of 200 right the table just right there anyway right um, what you can probably realize is that this 280 here is actually above the 200 so in this phase of this process uh, measuring out the liquid this part of it here for this half an hour is actually crossing the workplace exposure limit of 200 right as well as I guess um, supervision of mixing and transfer of mixtures to containers it's 150 which is actually very close to the 200 of the workplace exposure limit so the way I would do part B is looking at ways then to minimize the exposure along these processes here so i would probably want to see something more or less like maybe using some sort of um, mechanical means of measuring out the liquid automatically right i may want to say something like maybe proper ppe has to be given to the worker right i may want to say something like maybe proper ventilation I remember this is would have been this is a uh, more or less you know um you know the transfer of liquid in a container right 
So you may say so you may want to say things like proper ventilation and doing like using it in an open area. And that, and that would have been four answers right there anyway, right? Um, I would I could probably still mention this one: adding liquid to the mixing vessel that this need to be done using the proper safe system of work, a proper way of working. Maybe using um you know uh aerated containers, right? Um, supervision of mixtures again this could be a way that you can twist this and say that this is a control transfer of mixtures to containers as well you may want to talk about things like maybe transferring a small amount at a time you may want to probably say things again like for example um, if possible if they could have used like a different form of the substance right if it is liquid maybe they could have used it maybe like in pellet form etc so if you go through these here and you look at that you can probably find ways of still reducing the exposure to the worker again even though the average concentration or the time weighted average is within the workplace exposure limit right but to really um say that it is sufficient which it is uh, is i mean yes it is according to the law but according to the question they want uh, seven more responses you know on what could be done right um what actions the employer might need to take to control exposure to the liquid so you could probably even mention things like i guess if you remember the last lesson with fume cupboards and you know different types of hoods and stuff to reduce the exposure in the overall area right comment on exposure to uh to b so let's go back up the exposure to b is um again i mean it's one mark you see the overall exposure is 50 right parts per million and the um the workplace exposure limit is 200 300 which means we are well within limit but i may still want to look at it and see if there's any part of it that is very close to the workplace exposure limit 140 and probably still want to address that yes it is within limit but maybe something could be done here uh, while measuring out the liquid because that is causing the greater um, part of um, exposure anyway right I'm going up and down with this thing right um, so uh, part D there is a concern that exposure to a mixture of these two liquids might increase the risk to employees consider why why this might be a valid concern so there is a concern that exposure to a mixture of these two liquids might increase the risk to employees consider why that this might be a valid concern and again this would have been i'm not too sure if we did that on this lesson but it's one we covered before um this is all about the effects of mixtures right that if you mix two i guess two okay chemicals together you may end up with something that is much more you know um harmful right and there were different words we use if i remember them correctly they were words like synergistic meaning that they would have like a multiplicative effect right you have words like additive meaning that if you put two of them together you're gonna get the sum total of their um combined effect being you know the sum of those two effects anyway so that is what they were looking at there for um the effects of the mixtures and um that is sufficient to get the marks right i um don't want to read any of this here for you all uh, maybe you could touch a little piece of it um it's too long to read anyway hopefully you have this you can get this done um but I, i'm sure i touch every piece of it anyway um in the answers right um so i want to get back to the lesson you get it you can take a read of it and um let's see if we can get back into the powerpoint at least where i have it right so um that is that part there and um i really just wanted to mention one other thing again right um which would have been these sorbent tubes to the back here right um so we we did mention um dust a lot and the different types of sampling head used for dust right but these tubes that, the, that you're looking at here these are really used for chemical um you know um analysis and um simply put these are really meant for like gases right so um let me just try to find the page in your book there again this would be um page 95 right so stain tube or colometric tubes and how these work anyway um these have a reagent inside of it normally it's a colored crystal and what happens i mean the tube comes like this both ends of it is sealed 
um, I'm trying to see if we can have a better picture for two. But if you have never seen them, I mean, they, they come calibrated. There are marks on them, and there's a there's an arrow head mark on it to tell you that that's the end to put within um, a pump, right? And the other end, you're gonna have to break that off. And when you put it into the pump, there are different types of pump. You can find this, I guess, um, in your book. But um, just over the top of my head, you have things like a piston pump. You have a diaphragm pump. I'm not seeing it in your book there as yet, right? Um, but uh, uh, so what you do with that is that once you put it in, in, like into the pump and you compress the pump, the pump will normally draw air through the broken end of the tube. And if you are testing, let's say for hydrogen sulfide or maybe maybe carbon monoxide or something, right? Or basically ammonia. What's going to happen is that um, if the reagent in the tube was, you know, the sort that would react with that gas, it will cause a stain or it will cause a color change. I see a stain because a stain because um, the color will actually spread. And what they are able to do is measure the point at which the spread would have stopped to the initial, you know, like where the color is supposed to be. They'll minus those two and they will get an average concentration of the the gas that is in the atmosphere. Now, they are very um, uh, problematic. You have advantages and disadvantages of these stain tube detectors anyway, right? Um, one of which being that, um, you know, a different tube is used for a different gas. So one tube can attest multiple gases then, right? Meaning that um, if you had bought a tube for ammonia and you test the air for ammonia, and it turned out negative that doesn't mean the air is safe to breathe because the tube only tests ammonia they could have had other gases there like methane and carbon monoxide so basically one tube per gas and then um, it's not that difficult to use it's pretty simple you put it into the pump and you compress the pump and it works anyway from there right i guess some 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 skill may have to be in estimating the the length of the stain and i think that's where a lot of the problems are at i have actually used some of these before um it is problematic right and uh, you have to estimate where exactly did the stain stop right uh, and so once you're able to get that do i know people who use this some people say it's um it's about 25 percent wrong right it's 25 percent wrong because it's not really like a direct reading instrument it's really does you estimate in the length of the stain to really get an average of the concentration so you can probably find this if you want to think of this this could be used like in an initial appraisal we mentioned that in the last lesson this could be used like in an initial appraisal and then once you determine that ammonia is present, you could probably use a more sensitive piece of equipment to get those results out, right? Now, um, uh, I think you should have an idea of that, right? And just maybe to summarize that these stain tube detectors or these color metric uh, tubes are used for gases and vapors and stuff. And you have the sample head and the pumps. Those are really meant for, for dust, right? The difference in the weight of the filter that is collected over the eight hours that is basically used for dust and then these here these tubes are typically used for um for gases right so i have um two videos here i want to see if they could run on the system and um i'll come back and i'll try to end the session there anyway Calibrated to draw in 100 milliliters of air per stroke. 
and works with the tubes to deliver readings within 10% deviation of the results. This is incredibly accurate for tube testing. Since the bellows style pump operates without electricity, it's ideal for sampling air in areas that may have explosion hazards. The Draeger Akiro manual colorimetric tube pump couldn't be easier to use, offering unparalleled reliability and accuracy. If you're looking for a versatile option for a wide variety of gas detection needs, the Akiro pump might be the perfect solution for you. Thanks for watching, and as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to give us a call or visit us online at pksafety.com. So um, that would have been one of them there, uh, just an idea of those um, the Draeger tube and the pump. The pump you're looking at there would have been um, the diaphragm pump, right? If you check your book, you'll see that one out a bit as well. Right, I have one more. Um, I think this is it here. And then at the end of this, you know, I'll close up this lesson anyway, right? Um, let me see if this one will work and see what happens. cyclone holder to the worker's collar with the cyclone pointed down. Bring the tubing up and around their back. Use the tubing clip to attach the tubing in place along their shirt so it is not swaying away from their body. Do not remove the red grit pot part of the cyclone. This will catch the larger particles that are separated during sampling. Turn on the pump and record the time to the minute that you started the pump. After sampling, Keep the filter cyclone holder pointed down as you remove the cyclone and replace the top part of the filter cassette and both colored nibs. It is important that you do not tip the filter cyclone upright so that you do not spill any of the larger particles captured in the cyclone onto the filter. Discard the material in the cyclone and grit pot and once back in a controlled environment, reassemble the filter cyclone and chamber to perform post calibration. Okay, so um, just two quick videos there and um, I guess the latter one would have been for um, respirable dust, right? So I would um, I would close up this one here anyway, right? Um, the, you know, the folks who I guess are paying attention to the news, right? I was saying there, I would bring this lesson down right here and um, just to kind of and you know with a note that um that you know for those who've been looking at the news the british prime minister boris johnson was taken to the icu um facility in the uk well that facility in that hospital anyway i think it's st thomas right so keeping i guess the, the you know thousand other folks who are going through this pandemic at the moment right um please remember to give these past papers a try right i'm not seeing much of them from the diploma classes right so you can run through back the video um really i crossed the 30 minutes and i actually knew when i crossed it anyway but then the content and like to me there was still so much more to see but we're gonna have to um close off this one anyway right so just as you know i have two minutes again i'll probably let this one be the full 45 minutes then right so on average we looked at um really two main means of monitoring sample monitoring and one of those would have been for dust and for dust it was quite varied because you had different types of sampling head you had different types of heads for um you know different types of particle size you had the seven hole head filter you had the cyclone you had the um you had the coal right and uh for gases which is what we ended off there with the gases you basically could use these stain tube detectors and again different types of tubes there for different types of um, gases right so uh, if you get some time you can read up on those I'm sure there are way much more passapers outside there 
right um, that latter one though was a good 20 mark question so if you get any more please do them as you have some time I mean a, a good idea is to use some of the hours of your day those of us who are home anyway um, to kind of get into this work a bit right so all the best I'll see you all um, next well next week with another video anyway right all the best bye